Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Lawrence Reed to the Institute. Uh, Dr. Reed is the president for the Foundation for Economic Education. He's going to be speaking to us this morning about his book, The Primer of um, the Great Depression. Dr. Reed. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I am thrilled to be here for a lot of reasons. And one is that I was uh, privileged to have the opportunity a moment ago to tell Tom Woods in person that his book, Meltdown, was the first that I bought and read on my new Kindle 2. And I, <laughs> it was fantastic. And the other reason is uh, it gave me an opportunity to reminisce with my old friend Jeff Tucker about things that uh, we did 20 some years ago. I don't know if many of you know, but Jeff and I, well, let me put it this way. Uh, I think I was the first person that Jeff Tucker was ever arrested with <laughs> in, in 1986 in Managua, Nicaragua. We were briefly detained, arrested, our film confiscated, and uh, for all I know, he's been arrested many times since, but I, <laughs> I was the first, uh, first person to be arrested with him. I'm probably the only person here today who is uh, promoting not a book, but rather a, a pamphlet. And uh, in, in fact, uh, I'm not, not sure exactly where it is, but we shipped enough, I think, to give to everybody. hope I'm not incorrect about that. If, at, at most, it may be a dollar. So if any of you want to file an anti-dumping lawsuit against me, <laughs> uh, we are, if not giving it away, at least selling it below cost. Or you can go online at fee.org and find Great Myths of the Great Depression. That's actually the, uh, the title of it. And see it there and buy it for a dollar. And uh, even if you only want to read a few pages, you have to buy the whole thing. So I suppose you could file an anti-bundling uh, lawsuit against me too. But the purpose of that little essay, uh, now in its, I think, seventh or eighth edition, uh, is not really to reveal startling new original insights, but rather to uh, convey to a broad lay public uh, what I think are the real explanations of the Great Depression, to counter the conventional view that uh, what happened in 1929 and persisted through the 30s was somehow the failure of laissez-faire. I felt for a long time that uh, there's a lot of great scholarship, a lot of great books out there that need to be more widely disseminated, but there also needed to be something short and sweet that uh, a person from the broad lay public could uh, connect with and understand the true origins of this crisis. It's especially important right now in light of uh, what we're going through and so many allusions uh, to the 1930s being made these days. Uh, so I'll summarize uh, at least 12 years of our history into the next roughly 12 minutes by saying that the uh, Great Depression is best understood not as one big giant lump of an event, but rather as an event that has some distinct phases. And uh, uh, my former professor at Grove City College Dr. Hans Senholtz used to talk about the four phases of the Great Depression, with the first one being the financial or the monetary phase. This is what explains why it began, began first, in fact, as a recession. It's the later uh, elements, the later phases that explain why a recession became much worse and persisted for as long as it did. It wasn't the first American Depression, but it was, by any measure, the deepest and the longest in American history, about three times longer than any of the previous depressions. All of the others were over with in a year or two or three, or at the most, maybe four. This one goes for at least 12 years. That cries out for an explanation. The financial or monetary phase explains that uh, the crisis had its roots in improvident monetary policy of the 1920s. Uh, from the uh, newly minted Federal Reserve System that had been uh, created just a few years before. Uh, I can hardly think of another federal agency that has more fully failed at least its public mandate or mandates over the years than the Fed. When you think of the things that we were told over the years that this agency would do for us, they include such things as uh, providing just the right amount of currency, ironing out the business cycle, helping to promote full employment, and, and yet, uh, in the years since, we've had, what, one Great Depression, at least a dozen recessions. We've had, uh, now we have a dollar that's worth about a nickel of what it was worth uh, when the Fed first started. That screams manifest failure to me. Uh, and you see this in the policies uh, that preceded the Depression and uh, were coincident with it. You see it in what Murray Rothbard thoroughly documented as a very substantial, by some measure, 66% roughly, expansion of money and credit 
uh, in the, from 1924 to late 28, early 29, followed by a contraction of the money supply that the Fed presided over and helped to engineer by some one third. So I like to tell audiences, if you're ever wondering about why the economy seems to go through this roller coaster, take a look at what they're doing with the money and credit supply. It too looks like a roller coaster. You can't have a 66% expansion of the money supply and then a 33% contraction and expect a flat economy or, or, or good outcomes. And those who argue that the deflation was the proper prescription to remedy the ills of the inflation, uh, remember Dr. Senholtz saying, well, that's a little like you know, running over a man with a truck and then deciding that the way to help him out is to put it in reverse and back up over it. <laughs> that explains 1924 to the late 1930s. Some people mistakenly look at October 24, 1929 and say, well, that's what caused the Depression, Black Thursday, the collapse of the stock market. But they're looking at a mere symptom. The market had already turned around and, and uh, peaked out in August. We had many bad days by late October. And that's in great measure because the smarter folks who look at things like monetary policy and trade flows and what Congress is doing and what have you, they saw that the Fed had changed its policy dramatically, were jacking up interest rates, contracting the money supply, and the pressure of their selling causes the market to begin to turn down. It's not until the masses of people uh, stampede and see the handwriting on the wall that you have the crash. It's explained best by the roller coaster monetary policy. If nothing else had happened, 1930 might have been a year of recovery, might have been a year of mere recession. In fact, in the spring of 30, unemployment was only about where it is today, 8% or so, not yet a depression. The stock market had regained half the ground that it had lost since the big crash. But something else happened to take a bad situation and make it far worse, and that is uh, the second phase of the depression we call the disintegration of the, American e of the world economy. Uh, the passage of the Smoot-Hawley tariff in June of 1930 that raised tariffs to an all-time high and virtually closed the borders. Uh, uh, even if foreigners hadn't responded by raising their barriers by retaliation, which you must expect, even if they hadn't, it, this would have been crushing to world trade because you cannot close the door to imports without sooner or later uh, closing the door to exports. And American export industries were crushed particularly agriculture, because if foreigners can't sell here, how can they earn the dollars that they need to buy here? Thousands walked off American farms, which had a very negative spiraling downward effect on, on rural banks. And by uh, 1932, uh, we were in full-scale, deep, double-digit unemployment depression. But even before we get to the third phase, I, I like to throw this other event in here, because chronologically it happens before the third phase, even though it's not a world trade matter. In 1932, we had this yawning federal budget deficit, obviously because people weren't working, businesses out of, uh, closing their doors, not paying taxes, and government spending was not retreating to meet the shortfall. So you had this yawning deficit, and Hoover and the Republicans decided we've got to close that. Let's try it by uh, uh, raising taxes. They passed the Revenue Act of 1932, which doubled the income tax in the midst of depression. The top rate went from about 23% to something like 63, 64, 65%, more than a doubling at the top rate. Other taxes as well, excise and some others, were raised as part of that bill. Then you had an election. Herbert Hoover gets renominated, couldn't possibly win uh, in that kind of circumstance. He runs against the charismatic, silver tongued orator, Governor of New York, Franklin Roosevelt, who promises that if elected, he's going to reduce the intrusions of government. One of the virtues of this little pamphlet, I think, it kind of draws out so that the ordinary citizen can understand that Franklin Roosevelt properly assailed Herbert Hoover, not for being a laissez-faire president, as the history texts do, but for being an interventionist. He, do you know that in the Democratic platform of 1932, it actually called for a 25% reduction in federal spending? John Nance Garner, uh, Roosevelt's uh, running mate, accused Hoover of, quote, taking the country down the path to socialism. Okay, They uh, assailed him for raising tariffs, raising taxes, properly so. If I had been around in 32 and a voter, I probably would have voted for Franklin Roosevelt, uh, thinking that uh, he meant what he said. But of course, upon election, he did precisely the opposite. The third phase of the uh, Great Depression we call the phase of the New Deal. 
Uh, and there's a lot about that phase we could talk about. I'll just cite two of the landmark New Deal laws that had a, an incredibly depressing effect on the economy. The National Industrial Recovery Act. Uh, motivated by the notion that there was too much competition in the economy. We've got plummeting prices, of course. You've, you've closed markets with a high tariff. You're, you're contracting the money supply. So you've got plummeting prices. Competition's the culprit. Uh, if only we can crush competition, then we can stimulate higher prices, and that'll spread prosperity into ever-widening circles. Uh, so this was a, a law attempting to organize or cartelize American industry around federally issued codes and price controls. A uh, famous case uh, involving a guy named Jack Magid, who um, was a tailor, and he pressed, pressed a suit of clothes for the price of 35 cents. He was prosecuted because the New Deal uh, NRA code price was 40 cents. Now think of it, midst of depression, you're lucky if you have anything to, to pay to have your clothes pressed, Here's a guy willing to do it for 35 cents. He gets, he gets prosecuted because he didn't charge you 40 cents. Incredibly depressing, raising the cost of doing business across the board. But if that's something, where do you hear the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, it motivated by the notion that we have too much supply, prices are too low, let's get prices up. It levies a new tax on agricultural processors, okay, on an industry already deeply depressed, and uses the revenue to supervise the program to destroy perfectly healthy cattle, sheep, and pigs, and plow under perfectly good fields of corn, wheat, cotton, and other crops. The idea is restrict the supply, raise the price, improve the economy. <laughs> Never mind that those who sell at the higher price maybe have less to sell, or that even if this could have helped them, it could only have done so at the expense of everybody else. This is redistribution by gunpoint, this is by destruction. This is hardly a prescription for recovery, but that's what we did. Uh, we were freed of the worst of FDR when the Supreme Court threw both of those things out in the middle part of the decade, and the economy showed some signs of life until 1937 when we had a, another very swift collapse, uh, unemployment soaring again to the neighborhood of 20%. That's explained by things like Roosevelt's high taxes, the undistributed profits tax he got through Congress on corporate retained earnings, Meantime, he was pushing up taxes everywhere he could. Uh, you know, he inherited a top income tax rate of, in the 70s, but he takes it to 91, ultimately. And the typical history text will not tell you that he proposed one of 98%. Didn't get that because some congressman said, wait a minute, I come from a state that has a 3 or 4% income tax. How are we going to get ours if he gets 98? <laughs> but also, <laughs> but then Roosevelt came back and then by executive order imposed a 100% income tax rate on all incomes over $25,000. Uh, it was only there briefly, Congress overrode it, but that's what he attempted to do. Uh, and uh, also the uh, monetary policy of the late 30s became once again restrictive, and uh, in, in the face of previous inflation of money and credit. Then you had the Wagner Act, by far the most depressing factor that explains 1937, uh, granting of enormous new powers to labor unions, taking labor out of the ordinary courts of law, creating the National Labor Relations Board, and uh, bestowing upon us ever since this uh, uh, unbelievably, incredibly stupid system of uh, uh, federal involvement in, in labor ma matters and, and imbuing labor unions with a new militancy that dramatically raised the cost of business and scared away many investors who might have given us a lift in 1937. Well, I hope I've said enough about that little essay to make you want to get a copy, uh, whether it's free or a dollar. I can't remember, but uh, it's goodbye in any case. <laughs> Thank you very much.